Hello and welcome to the Hawk Off the Press podcast. I'm your new host, John Steffi. My first guest is Gary Barta, the University of Iowa Director of Athletics and Chair of the College Football Playoff Selection Committee. Gary, how are you today? I'm doing fine, John. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the time. So to start off on a popular topic, I think for most fans, beer, you know, who doesn't like that? How much money, now that it's been a couple home games, has the department been making now that beer is being sold at Kinnick? Well, believe it or not, we don't have any final numbers yet. And, and, and the reason why is uh, there, there's quite a bit of startup cost because this was brand new. Uh, the, the sales are really good, really positive. Uh, and then after the initial uh, expenses are taken out, then, then Aramark, who is our provider, uh, they'll they'll take out their uh, operating expenses, and then after that we'll split it half and half, and then after that, out of our half, thirty uh, percent of of our portion is going to go to the alcohol harm reduction committee on campus. So uh, by the end of the year, we'll have a you know we'll have a, a final number. I think it will be six figures, um, but but we just really won't won't know un, until the season's over. That being said, uh, we're really pleased with how it's gone. We're three games in, as you point out, and uh, our fans have, have uh, really appreciated it. Uh, knock on wood, it's, uh, it's kind of been as we expected. Uh, there, there haven't been, I think we're averaging uh, just under two arrests. I say two arrests, under two arrests, because it, we had won the first game, three the second game, and won the third game, um, which I'm very pleased about. I mean, I wish there were zero, but... Um, so over, overall, safe, legal, and responsible is our mantra. And uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it's going very well. Okay. And then from one change to another to this season, mobile ticketing, kind of a big change for fans. How has that gone so far? Well, I usually measure how change is going or how things are going based on uh, the feedback I get from fans. And I don't get positive feedback. No one ever <laughs> sends me something saying, hey, things are great. I uh, just thought I'd write and tell you that. Uh, and I have, I, I'm getting to the answer of your question. I have had zero uh, emails or inquiries about mobile ticketing. Now, that doesn't mean we haven't had glitches. Certainly we have. Uh, but when I think back to this summer, our staff worked, our ticket staff worked really hard to educate our fans. Uh, there are some fans who just weren't comfortable, and so they they printed those tickets. But the vast majority of our fans, uh, not only are they using the mobile ticketing system, but I've been told anecdotally that you know they're now used to. So I bought my season tickets, and I now know how to transfer them to a friend if I can't use them, and and that's actually a lot easier than figuring out: Do I drop these in the mail? Do I have my neighbor have to you know drive over and pick them up? Um, so. I would just say it's another change this year. We've had several changes heading into the year and, um, and knock on wood, it, it, it actually is going very well. Does that get more difficult when I remember you saying at the last PCA meeting about how there's kind of the challenge in terms of hiring enough workers for the stadium? Yeah, I, I, mobile ticketing hasn't impacted that, but um, we are absolutely... Uh, on a week to week basis, to just doing everything we can. We, we uh, you know, on a full game like we're going to have against Penn State uh, in a sellout mode, we might employ upwards of almost a thousand people to work the game, whether it's parking, concessions, ticket taking, uh, security, everything that we do. And uh, we've, we've just, like every other uh, business or organization, we just uh, are struggling to find workers. Now, thankfully, um, we've done fine. And, uh, you know, I think our fans understand that we're a little short staffed, but I think our fans have had a great experience. So uh, if somebody's listening and watching this uh, and they want to work at, at uh, Kinnick Stadium, <laughs> go on our website and sign up. We'd love to have you. And unfortunately, it seems like COVID is still kind of lingering as a topic um, in today's world. Where does um, the staff and athletes stand in terms of vaccination rates right now? Yeah, I'm very pleased, as, as I think everybody who lives in our state knows, um, that, that there, we can't have mandatory vaccinations. And despite that, uh, our vaccination rate is at 92%. So it's not 100%. Uh, we'd love to have it 100%, but it's 92%. And I'm just, I'm proud of our student athletes and our coaches uh, and our staff. 
Um, and, and as a result of that, knock on wood, um, you know, clearly we are still in a pandemic, uh, but compared to a year ago, I, I'll take right now, because remember a year ago, we didn't have fans. Uh, there was a point in August where we weren't even going to play sports. And so to see where we're at now and to have Kinnick Stadium full and our field hockey's ranked number one in the country and soccer's off to a great start. So uh, I'm really thrilled with where we're at. And then long term, I, you know, the medical community, I think, is suggesting that we're going to be dealing with COVID for many years. And so it's just a, a, a product of learning how to manage it, learning how to, and, and I think vaccination is a big part of that and, and just learning how to, how to uh, take care of ourselves when, we, when someone does get it. So with that 92% number, is that including all athletes, staff, coaches, et cetera? The, the measurement we use to report to the Big 10 focuses on all athletes and all coaches. Uh, so that's what the 92% represents. And we, oh, wow. we report that into the Big Ten. Everybody in the Big Ten has to report in uh, what their vaccination rates are. So you've seen the other schools' numbers. How does Iowa's compare to their Big Ten peers? I think well, we're, we're right near the top, but I would tell you that um, I think 80-some percent is the lowest percent in the Big Ten. So I think the vast majority, uh, if not every school in the Big Ten, is really uh, taking this seriously and is doing a great job in some schools, uh, they're actually able to mandate vaccination. Those schools are hundred uh, percent, but most schools are over 90%. So I, I think we, we sit in a good place, but it, so does the whole big 10. Now, if you had the ability to mandate vaccinations, would you? It's hypothetical. Uh, so, uh, I can't. And so we, we manage it the way we can. I absolutely encourage uh, myself and, and anybody I talk to to get vaccinated. And then what's it been like in terms of, obviously you are mentioning last year where things are a lot different in terms of still managing when there may be a breakthrough case here and there? Well, we've had very few, thankfully, uh, but when we do, our medical staff has a great protocol. Um, you know, there's contact tracing uh, in Johnson County, uh, if you're not vaccinated, if you are vaccinated, you go through a little different process. For those that aren't vaccinated in our in our program, they test three times a week, um, and so there's a there's a really tight protocol to doing everything we can to keep people safe. And then, of course, uh, if somebody does have a breakthrough infection, um, they go through the 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 C, CBC uh, the the protocol, the CDC, uh, which I believe off the top of my head, I think it's ten days. All okay. right. Well, Gary, thank you for the time today. Thank you, John. And uh, congratulations on, on your new role and look forward to working with you. Thank you. The next guest on the Hawk Off the Press podcast is Emily Giambalvo from the Washington Post. Emily has covered University of Maryland athletics for the Post since 2018. Emily, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So first of all, now we're four games into the season. What should Iowa fans expect from this Maryland team on Friday? I, I think it all starts with Talia Tungavailoa. Obviously, that's the guy who has been getting so much attention lately. He has just proven to be a super reliable quarterback who doesn't really make many mistakes and, and also gives the offense kind of that big play ability that it seems like I was done such a good job limiting. Um, so <laughs> it's almost like w- which thing breaks this weekend. Um, but I think he, he really makes the offense work and he has a bunch of talented receivers. And I think that's, that's always going to be kind of the eye popping part of Maryland's team. And from what I've seen from a distance, it seems like he's a quarterback who can use his feet but not really one that relies on it can still be a pretty good pocket passer. Yeah. And it's funny. I really don't, we haven't really seen him use his feet too much this year, but last year, I mean, he would every so often have a 30 yard run or, and, and he started to almost seem like this, you know, so-called mobile quarterback, which I wasn't really expecting. And then um, we haven't really seen it as much this year, but I do think it's something he can do and isn't afraid to do. He's been maybe a little tentative in that regard, but he hasn't really needed to use his feet. Um, But he is just really good extended 
extending plays. So even if it's not him taking off for a 30 yard run, maybe he scrambles out of the pocket and somehow can still hit his receivers. He always, he always surprises me when he does that. I'm like, Oh, this, I thought this was going to be like a throwaway pass or, you know, something that isn't a big play. And then he can, he can kind of turn those bad situations into big plays. And then kind of switching gears onto the defensive side, what's this Maryland defense been like four games in? I think it's been much better than anyone really thought. Um, the defensive line, it, kind of on both sides of the ball, offensive line, de- defensive line, were just big areas that Loxley needed to improve. And it's something that you can't fix overnight. Um, it takes a l- many years in recruiting to kind of fix those areas. And he brought in a bunch of junior college guys, and now they're kind of like settling into the system. And they've done a really good job of just affecting other teams' quarterbacks. I I know Maryland as a team and some of the players are getting pretty high up on some of the sacks leaderboards. Um, Sam O has been great. And they're just all these guys who are now veterans. They used to be brand new, like fresh out of junior college, getting used to uh, Loxley's system. And and they've been really good. And then that allows the secondary. They've been playing man coverage and um, got a lot of talented defensive backs, too. I think the linebackers group is, is where the concern is. There's just been a bunch of injuries. It used to kind of be like a strength of this team. And now things are a bit more uncertain. Um, but, but as a whole, I think the defense has been quite good this year. And I was a little surprised as I was watching a bunch of the Maryland-Kent State game, how much they really were just doing that single man coverage. Yeah, and it, it was something that Loxley basically committed to. I think he, he always talks about his second half of the Minnesota game last year. And Maryland's defense had really struggled um, early in the season. And basically they just said, hey, we're, we're going to commit to it. Um, we think we have talented guys who can handle it. And once they did that and, and the DBs kind of showed that they can win those one-on-one battles, he was like, yeah, okay, let's do it. And since that moment, um, the defense has been a lot better and they've kind of just rolled with it and trusted those guys who are still somewhat young in the secondary, but, but that they can handle it. And, and it's been better since then. Have they been getting burned by big plays? Because that's obviously the risk when you do that. Um, I don't think so, but when you look at the teams they've played, it hasn't been a lot of those, like teams are susceptible to making big plays. Um, but it, it hurt them a little bit at times last year, but, but it's like to the extent where it's still worth it, I think to, to do it because they're able to pressure quarterbacks. And um, I, I can't really think of too many instances where it's been an issue this year, but again, it, it's almost like, you know, they, they've played Illinois and West Virginia and I think West Virginia might turn out to be a pretty good team, but it's just so hard to know like how much they've really been tested this year. I was about to say 4-0, but when, you know, some of those wins are against Kent State, Howard, and Illinois, not sure how much you can really get a read off what that means. Yeah, and, and obviously this, this game is the one that will tell us everything. Um, but to some extent, and, and maybe Iowa fans won't be happy to hear this, but like, I think you could argue some of the same with Iowa. I mean, Indiana, Mm -hmm. Iowa state are are better wins, I think, than Illinois and West Virginia. Um, But it, but it's still kind of a team that hasn't gone against like a top tier big 10 team. So I think um, it'll be closer than what you'd imagine on paper with like a number five team unranked Maryland. Um, Mm -hmm. But, but it, it does have some of those feelings. And I think what, what you're doing instead is you just go off of like, what what it's looking like um and when Talia has been so good you're like okay I mean I feel like this should work um against a better (laughs) team but but it's just hard because it's like you know we don't know how he will react to a bit of almost like coach speak adversity like in a game of of going against a really good defense that might try to force him into mistakes yeah and you bring up that great point about the Iowa schedule because kind of at the beginning of the season people are really high on Indiana they aren't quite as high on Indiana anymore. People are really high on Iowa State. Not so high on Iowa State anymore after they lost to Baylor. Granted, I think Iowa State will be fine this week against Kansas. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I know I've kind of had those same that like same internal monologue with myself <laughs> thinking about Iowa, but then part of me is like, well, some of the reason we don't believe in those teams as much as because Iowa beat them, you know. So it's like yes. Iowa has played a role in that too. 
Um, but, but it, but it is interesting just to think, um, you know, I think we should think of Maryland more so as like a, maybe like a 25th ranked team. Like not, I'm not saying they should be ranked, but it's like, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's a lot different than them just feeling like a usual Maryland team, I guess. <laughs> and it's different <laughs> than what you would usually, as you're scrolling through the scores, see number five team versus unranked. Yes. Yeah. 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 And with it being kind of a short week of preparation, a flight all the way across the country, you know, it, it seems like, you know, there, there are some things that could make this game a bit more of a toss up than it would suggest. It sounds like Loxley isn't really a big fan of these Friday night games. Yeah. It was kind of funny that you said that, you know, usually coaches are so diplomatic and Loxley in particular kind of comes from that saving tree of just never saying anything too interesting <laughs> about about a game but uh, but he kind of scoffed at that which you know maybe makes sense and there are a lot of pieces of it um the fact that Maryland's done it twice now in three weeks you know that that's tricky and you think about it from a recruiting perspective and you can't have high school players out there on a Friday night for a big game because they're playing in their own games and um, it makes sense, but it always makes me laugh because when players talk about it, they just like light up. Cause they're like, Oh, it's like <laughs> high school football. And I'm like, it, it, so, so it is interesting to kind of see those different perspectives, but I, I think it certainly probably, even though Maryland's done it twice in the last three weeks, I still think it probably helps Maryland more than it hurts them just because they don't have to travel. It's funny that you pointed that out because it's almost the exact same thing at Iowa availabilities yesterday. It was funny. Like Kurt Ferentz, use the word okay for them <laughs> which I think might have been a little diplomatic he said oh well it's October so I'm okay with them if it's yeah. earlier in the year that would have been different but because it's October he's okay with them and then you ask the players and like Spencer Petrus was excited to finally be able to watch college football Tyler Goodson was excited to be able to go to his girlfriend's sorority day party on Saturday <laughs> He even was talking about his like 80s themed outfit that he's going to have. So it's like, (laughs) wow, these are like complete polar opposites here between what I'm hearing at 11 a.m. and 1.45 p.m. from the same football program. So that'll be funny. Um, And it seems like Demas is quite the wide receiver that maybe Iowa's secondary will have their hands full defending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and he really epitomizes those, like that big play ability. Um, I mean, it really, he's, I can't believe he's a senior now. That's what happens when you get into year four on the beat. You're like, Oh my (laughs) gosh, some of these players have been around for my whole time on this beat, but he was showing that even when he wasn't, he didn't used to be very consistent, right? He'd have like a a great game and then kind of have like a three game stretch without doing much. But when he was great, he would have those like 60 yard touchdown catches. And you would just think like, Oh, it's there. If if he can just figure out how to sustain it. And then really over the last year, he he's become the guy who can sustain it across from game to game to game. Um, And it's just been so impressive. I think he's like, in the last eight games, he scored a touchdown in seven of them. He finally wow. um, broke the streak at Illinois because uh, the play was actually called back for a penalty. He, he nearly um, had the streak, but, um, <laughs> but he's been really good. And again, it's kind of that example of like, can Iowa limit those big plays? Um, because Talia and Demas have been connecting great and same with Rakim Jarrett, who had a quiet game last weekend, but is always right up there with Demas as kind of 1A, 1B in terms of um, the receiving threat. So he's been good. It's, it's funny because Talia's his stat line was like 31 of 41 for 384 yards or something last weekend. And um, I'd say at least like five of those incompletions were drops by receivers. So, so it's like if, wow. if the receivers can kind of like flip it on even more um, it's, it's, it's kind of wild. They're, they're pretty good. I think some Iowa fans are going to be jealous of those numbers. The 384 passing yards. Well, I haven't really had that yet with Spencer Petrus. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, Maryland fans would have been right there with them before uh, Tungo Vailoa got here because there are they're like all sorts of stats that we were pulling out last week. But basically, um, I think so. Talia started eight games in his career and he's had, I think, three or four or five 300 yard games. And before he got here, Maryland hadn't had a single 
game with 300 passing yards since 2013. So it's like, wow. So it's like Maryland was in that exact same spot. Just <laughs> never, never really had a quarterback who could um, elevate the offense. And then that's kind of been this big um, switch that has allowed them to, to be better. It's been funny on the Iowa side, like a week ago, everyone was complaining about how there's never a throw from Petrus that went like more than 15, 20 yards. And then they pull out a couple 40 plus yard plays and it's like, oh, wow, fans no longer are really complaining about that, but not quite to that 300 level. And Kirk Ferentz was talking about how he was expecting a hostile environment for Maryland. Was that a stretch or is this actually going to be a hostile environment in College Park on Friday? Um, it, it could be a bit of a stretch just because kind of hearing those words. And if you've been to a Maryland game in the last few years, you're kind of like, wait, what? Um, but, <laughs> but that said, um, I mean, I, this is like such a grouchy DC person type complaint, but though getting <laughs> to a game at eight o'clock or, you know, trying to get there at six on a Friday in DC is not an easy thing to do, um, traffic wise. So, um, that maybe hurts Maryland a little bit, but then again, you know, some people maybe don't have anything else to do. Um, I think it will be a good atmosphere, probably one of the best atmospheres in a while, just because there is excitement around the program. I mean, when you talk about what they're doing this year, it's a lot of like, it's the first time since then it's the first time since that, um, with what Maryland is accomplishing. And it reminds me a lot and, and, you know, Maryland fans don't want to hear this, but two years ago, um, Maryland had a Friday night game against Penn state and they had announced that it was like the student section was sold out um, or, or that the game was a sellout in general, but before the two weeks before, and then Maryland goes up to Philadelphia and plays temple and, and gets beat. And it was like this oh. really deflating thing, but there was still some excitement for Penn state and they come and they get beat 59 to zero, but, but like Ooh. at kickoff, it was this great Friday night, you know, atmosphere. <laughs> and then like by the second quarter, nobody was there. Um, so, <laughs> so it's like, if it's a close game, I, I do think it will be a, a good atmosphere. Um, but, but it's funny kind of how it reminds people so much of that really, really big letdown two years ago. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they're probably not wanting that reminder. No. And, and to be fair, it was, it was Laxley's first year and, and there were only two wins that really gave credence to that hype. It was, it was Howard and Syracuse, but the problem was they put up like 63 points on Syracuse and Syracuse had been ranked in the top 25. Um, and it turned out that Syracuse team was really bad. So it was kind of one of those <laughs> things where it's week two, we don't really know much. And you think, wow, we just beat a ranked team by 40 points and fans are getting all excited when in reality, it turns out that team you beat wasn't that good to start. Oh, wait. It's Syracuse in yeah. football. <laughs> so um, then I've been seeing your video board tweets. Are these, is this video board when I'm there on Friday, will I see it in full function? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what they hope. Um, it, you know, the pictures were starting to flicker on yesterday, but then you also look at the calendar and you're like, wow, we're only a couple of days away from the game. I think that's a plan. You know, I think at first they thought Kent State was the plan. And, and I think the reason there's so much interest, like I, trust me, I don't want to spend my life tweeting about a video board, um, <laughs> but the fans are so interested in this thing. Um, but I think the reason for the frustration is that like, you know, I, I understand there's a pandemic going on, but like this thing has been planned for a while. And then you're like, we've known what the start of the football season is for years. And, and yet it's still kind of like, four or five weeks late. Um, so kind of like classic construction delays. Um, <laughs> but it would be a bit of a letdown if it's not ready because for the previous home games, they've kind of been carting in this like very small board that goes on top of a truck. Um, and you know, in the shadow of the, the big one, it just looks hilarious. Um, <laughs> so it wouldn't really fit the spectacle if, um, if they're not able to get turned on, but I, I think the goal is certainly to have it ready for Friday. <laughs> wow. I almost hope it's not ready then. So I get to experience <laughs> the comedic value of that. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty funny. <laughs> and then did I see the, the university canceled classes for this game? I, or I moved them virtual. Think, I think. Yeah. I think they've like suggested to professors to try to have them virtual, um, after 1 p.m. or something like that, um, because it's been a 
I, there've been a lot of complaints about how at first they were saying you couldn't get into the parking lots by 4 PM. And for people who want to tailgate, they're kind of like, wait, like we have this huge game and you're saying we can't get there. <laughs> and then again, the traffic problem will, will be a nightmare. Um, and I think they've bumped that up by an hour. So now it's 3 PM. Um, but that was kind of the big conflict of like having classes and then having the parking lots open for fans um and and i think some fans are just frustrated because they're like it's finally a moment where it feels like we're like you know maryland's a big time football program and and then it's like oh but you can't tailgate you can't get here uh, in time so i think there was a little bit of compromise but maybe still not as much as what some fans would have wanted and then one last question here that isn't quite football related so for any fans who are traveling to DC for this, or say a reporter who is traveling <laughs> to this, restaurant recommendations. Oh gosh, this is hard on the spot. Um, <laughs> I mostly, so I don't, I, I don't live in College Park. I live just outside DC. There's a lot of good food in DC. Um, I'm pretty good at breakfast food places. So there's like, um, Farmers Fishers Bakers is in DC. It's like a good sit down breakfast place and and lunch place. The Coop is a place I I've gone to. I lived nearby it for a bit for breakfast. Um, Milk and Honey is kind of a famous. It used to be in College Park. I don't think it's there anymore, but they have a few other locations as well. They're good breakfast place. Um, so I think those would be. There's this place by Nats Park called Chloe that I went to. It was like a fancy place. I'd never, it'd been a long time since I had like a, a good dinner. Um, and it was really good. It was like one of my favorite places I've ever gone in DC. Wow. Um, but that's like really far from College Park more so <laughs> if you're like staying by the airport. But um, yeah, I, th- I think that's what I'd go with. Okay. Well, thanks for the time. For listeners, you can follow Emily's work at Emily GM, spelled G-I-A-M on Twitter. Um, And I will be back with another edition of Hawk Off the Press after the final score Friday night. Thanks again for listening in and I will talk to you on Friday.